Warren Lincoln kept a lamp burning in the window, not to welcome an absent loved one, but as a signal to his brother that everything was all right. He thought someone was spying on him. His brother Edward lived nearby. They both ran the greenhouse and nursery and lived on the property. As long as the light was on, everything was all right. Lincoln was a small, ball-headed, middle-aged ex-lawyer of Chicago who operated a greenhouse and nursery on the outskirts of Aurora, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Lincoln moved to Aurora in the spring of 1920 with his wife, Lena Shoup Lincoln, and his teenage son from his first marriage, John. Lena didn't get along with her stepson, which caused a lot of arguments in the home. John eventually moved to Chicago to get away from her. Then there was Lena's brother, Byron. He was a large, muscular man whose extended visits from Kansas generated frequent quarrels. Some of the arguments allegedly ended with Warren having black eyes and bruises. Byron Shoup had been seen at the cottage during the first week of January 1923, but by the middle of the month, both he and Lena had disappeared from the community. When they disappeared, Warren was closed mouth about what had happened to them. But his brother Edward was not. He said, Lena had run off with another man, and Byron had gone back to Kansas. Warren had many wild stories about what happened. The first one was staged April 30th of that year. Relatives reported that Warren Lincoln himself was strangely missing. An investigation indicated that murder had been committed in his home. The furniture was disarrayed, as if a life and death struggle had ensued. Blood was spattered on the floor of his bedroom, and the window was open. There were blood stains on the sill. In the greenhouse lay an Indian club, a murderous-looking weapon. His wife, Lena, and her brother, Byron, were also missing. The authorities found other clues. Lincoln's nightdress and cap, and along with a pair of gloves belonging to his wife, were bloodstained. Those articles had been dropped on a nearby well. There was a trail through the greenhouse, as if a body had been dragged through it. Suspicion was directed at once to the brother-in-law, Byron Shoup, and Lena Lincoln. John, the 19-year-old son, told a story of how his father was about to institute criminal proceedings against Byron. John told the story and showed the investigator surgical instruments as familiar to midwives as to physicians in a dresser drawer in the home. The police at once spread a net across the country to find Lena and her brother. The police were sure that Lincoln had been murdered by the missing pair. But later, the blood at the crime scene was found to be animal blood. On June 10, Lincoln miraculously appeared alive and well in New York. He sent a telegram to his brother Edward asking for money. The next day, he returned to Chicago and notified the sheriff of Aurora he was back. He told the sheriff a wild and crazy tale of his adventures. He said he had been kidnapped and that he was the victim of a dope ring plot. He charged his missing wife with being a leader in the abduction. He said that he had filed suit for divorce, and for two weeks he was aware that two men had been stalking him. Lincoln told a wild story of being accused by the men of having several packages of drugs in the greenhouse. He had to agree to pay $200 if they wouldn't arrest him. A week later, he was kidnapped by his wife and three men, blindfolded, and taken to Chicago, where he was kept a prisoner for three weeks. He was then asked to join the gang of dope peddlers. He agreed in order to figure an escape. He was soon on his way to France. I know, this sounds wild. One of the men bought him a ticket to Baltimore. I guess that was making his way toward France. In Baltimore, he escaped and made his way to Buffalo, New York. The sheriff declared that his story was a product of a mind temporarily unbalanced by morphine. But the story was accepted, and Lincoln remained free while the hunt for his wife and Byron was escalated. Whispers around Aurora began to connect Lincoln with the pair's disappearance, so he left Aurora again. He dropped out of sight on October 20th. 
and was not seen again for months. Meanwhile, the search for Lena and Byron Shoup continued. Lena's relatives received a letter signed L. It asked that money be sent to her at Evanston, Illinois Post Office. The watch was kept there, and it was revealed that Warren collected the money, not Lena. Two weeks later, a check showed up signed by Warren Lincoln. Now the police were wanting to question him. They couldn't find him. He was traced to Chicago. Remember, Chicago is only 35 miles from Aurora. He was traced there because he had applied for work with a firm. The officers trailed him to Drexel Avenue and arrested him for fraudulently securing his wife's money through Evanston Post Office. He was taken back to Aurora for questioning, and on January 10, 1924, Lincoln produced another confession. He admitted to killing his wife after she had killed her brother. He said Byron and Lena were arguing. She became angry, rushed into the bedroom, got a revolver, and shot him. Lincoln said Lena then pointed the gun at him, so he picked up a stove poker and struck her. If the authorities believed this confession, he had a good case of self-defense. He then told authorities the gruesome tale of how he dismembered the bodies of his wife and Byron and burned them in the greenhouse boiler. He had the whole year to cover his tracks. One of his stories was that he found his wife cheating with a man who drove a Rio Roadster. He said Byron and he found him in the house one day as he fled as they came in. Then he told the story of how she tried to poison him. He told story after story. Well, let's cut to the chase. With Lincoln's legal background, he knew how to word things, stage the scene, and lie about what really happened to obstruct the case. This is how he screwed up. First, he sent letters to relatives of his wife and brother-in-law saying Byron had been in a car accident. He asked for money twice and received $500 one time and $400 another. He typed out letters on the same typewriter and with the same green typewriter ribbon so they could be traced. That mistake got him arrested. Then he told multiple stories and gave multiple confessions. The last big screw-up will come in the end of the story. He thought he was so brilliant. No bodies, no witness, no crime. He told how he cut up the bodies and burned them. He said that he had encased Lena and Byron's heads in concrete because they wouldn't burn sufficiently in the greenhouse oven. He said that when he put the heads in the concrete, he threw in quicklime, put the heads in burlap sacks, then covered them with concrete. He made a block of the concrete and used it to brace up the front porch. Authorities found no bodies. The boiler was clean and they had no concrete block. Well, Lincoln said he felt haunted having the concrete block holding up the porch so he removed it and took it to the city dump on the bank of the Fox River, about 300 yards from his greenhouse and home. Lincoln took the authorities to the dump. They walked from his house to the river bank. The lawyer florist, smoking cigarettes, dressed in his best, seemed to enjoy himself as he directed the search, much as a motion picture director would work when he would be on location. A group of prisoners from the county jail was brought over to do the heavy work. The police and Lincoln watched. At first the concrete block was nowhere to be seen. Down there somewhere, Lincoln said. The workmen dug and kicked aside rubbish and used their shovels vigorously. Getting warm, Lincoln yelled. Getting warmer. Lincoln encouraged the workers. At last, near the spot where he had first indicated, the digger struck something hard. Getting close, Lincoln said to the chief. At last, the stone was revealed. When Lincoln told them where to find the heads, he was asked how he killed them. He said he felt that Byron was his rival for Lena's affections. He said he caught them together. He had his revolver with him and shot Byron. He then said he shot Lena as she tried to escape with no clothes on. 
They took the block in an automobile to the police station and work begun with chisels. They worked carefully. The burlap was revealed and the faces uncovered. His next story was that he looked through a bedroom window at six in the morning, saw Lena and Byron together. He then ran to the greenhouse and got his revolver and shot them. With his legal background, all he was doing with the stories of Lena and Byron supposedly having an affair was so that he would be charged with justifiable homicide. Then, of course, he would get off scot-free. What better crime of passion than his wife having an affair with her brother right in the next room? The corpus delecti, or proof of crime, was committed, was definitely established when the heads were identified by the coroner and a relative of Shoup. The heads were perfectly preserved in the burlap and concrete. Lincoln again believed that he placed the quicklime in with the heads and that they would be so totally decomposed that there would be no way to identify whatever was left of them. And again, he would get off. But here is where he made his most stupendous error in his attempt to pull off the perfect crime. There were two barrels of lime in the greenhouse. One had contained a harmless slaked lime. The other unslaked, caustic quicklime. One day a hired man had accidentally transposed the barrels. Lincoln had dipped into the wrong barrel and thus ensured the preservation of the heads. I continued to wonder why did he do it? What was his real motive? One substantial motive was that Lincoln hoped to get Byron's $40,000 estate in Kansas. It was also rumored that he had a girlfriend in Chicago a great reason to get rid of his wife. Other odd happenings around Lincoln's world was the finding of a head of another man in the vicinity of Lincoln's greenhouse. And last but not least, Lincoln's first wife died mysteriously. It was claimed that she committed suicide by taking an overdose of painkillers. No suspicion was ever placed on him. Well, finally, Lincoln escaped the death penalty, thanks largely to an insanity defense. He won a verdict of life imprisonment. He died 17 years later in the state penitentiary at Joliet, Illinois. Was he a brilliant, evil man or just a conniving maniac? Thanks for listening. Subscribe for more. Bye. A week later, he was kidnapped by his wife and three men. <laughs> Oh.